Good morning. It is so amazing to be in a room that looks like this. It almost <laughs> never happens. Uh, thank you, Dr. Benson, for welcoming us so warmly and for hosting this symposium along with Arun, of course, my friend and colleague. Melanie, thank you for the heartfelt introduction and more important for your extraordinary leadership as the founder with Secretary Moniz of C3E. You are the living embodiment, Melanie, of what we're seeking to inspire through our global C3E efforts. So let me just ask everyone to join me in a round of applause for Melanie. We want to thank the Precord Institute for joining our partnership with MIT, as Melanie noted, in support of the US C3E program and this important symposium. Now I have to pause and say how wonderful it is to be back here at Stanford, what those of us who've worked here and the students who have the privilege of studying here call being on the farm. I spent 12 very happy years working here, indeed my first office here when I came back from serving in the Clinton administration in 1996 was right here on this land. It was a little house called Galvez House. It was a Center for International Security and Cooperation. Uh, we moved to Encina Hall and this gorgeous alumni center was subsequently built. Uh, but it feels very much like coming home for me. <clears throat> I did leave uh, in the end of 2008, early 2009, to join the Obama administration in Washington. Uh, but Stanford still beckons and indeed uh, has already successfully reclaimed a member of my family. My son Richard, sitting at table four, is a freshman in the class of 2019. And uh, his passion is STEM. So that's a good thing for all of us. To situate this special symposium in a broader context, uh, everyone has already mentioned, both Sally and Melanie, that tomorrow we're gathering the energy ministers from 23 countries and the European Commission here for the seventh clean energy ministerial to discuss how we can all work together to meet our ambitious Paris climate commitments. But as Sally noted, do far more than that because we realize that that will not be enough. We need to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy and spur innovation in science and technology through initiatives like mission innovation so that we can power the world with low carbon power. For those of you who aren't yet familiar with it, Mission Innovation is a commitment that was made by 20 countries announced on the first day of the Paris Climate Talks last year to seek to double our funding of clean energy research and development in the next five years. This initiative is designed to greatly accelerate the pace of clean energy research and development and expand the pipeline of clean energy technologies. The International Energy Agency estimates that meeting global emissions targets will require a $13.5 trillion investment in clean energy and energy efficient technologies between now and 2030. And that will also require a massive investment in human capital. The President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology has determined that in the United States alone we will need approximately 1 million more STEM professionals. Uh, that we then we will currently produce at the rate that we are proceeding in the coming decade. So in truth, we just don't have enough students, men or women, in the STEM pipeline right now to meet our needs. And the same is true in many countries around the world. We really need these young minds. And if we're going to meet our global climate and energy challenges and develop the clean energy technologies of tomorrow, we also need to get more people, a more diverse group of people, and especially more women involved in innovating and working in this field. And that's where you and we and C3E come in. So I thought today I would offer you some thoughts on what we can do as professionals working in these areas to get more young women into STEM and clean energy fields and discuss the importance of outreach, mentoring, and where men fit in to this equation. So we are celebrating the fifth anniversary of this remarkable program. Those of you who came together to launch it recognized that women remained consistently underrepresented in STEM generally and in energy fields specifically. So C3E was established in order to attract more women to clean energy careers, to support women's advancement, to provide role models and advocates for women, and to create networks where women in clean energy can share ideas, opportunities, and resources. 
We know that diverse groups representing a wide range of thoughts and ideas can help us to generate the new ideas and reach better decisions that we need to make. As I travel around the country in this amazing job, and indeed around the world, I make an effort everywhere I go to meet with women working in STEM fields. It's always interesting to hear their stories, and for those of you who are of my generation, many of them will be very familiar to you. For example, I've heard from senior scientists in our lab network who went through graduate school working in buildings that had no women's restrooms and a ge geologist at our National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado told me that during the 1970s she had to abandon her plans to do research in Antarctica because the crews of three different ships canceled on her, asserting that women are bad luck on boats. <laughs> Early in my own career, when I was working for Joe Biden in the Senate, my first job out of graduate school, I visited an Air Force base where the leadership of the base had been told that Dr. Sherwood was coming. They had rolled out a red carpet to welcome me, which was a very nice thing for them to do. And as I got out of the car that delivered me, the official who met me in uniform said, well, we're glad you're here, but when is Dr. Sherwood coming? <laughs> I also hear from younger women, including some on my own staff whose efforts have been inspired by the example set by women like you, women who are blazing new trails, doing extraordinary things, and challenging the future. Sometimes setting the example that we can set is crucial to opening minds to new possibilities and giving them the courage that they can break through those glass ceilings. In 1994, when I was serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in another formerly very male bastion, the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, I was asked by Uzbekistan's Defense Minister, Rustam Akhmedov, to come and speak at Uzbekistan's newly minted Officer Training Academy, the first place for training officers in Central Asia after the Soviet Union collapsed, because in the Soviet period, all officers were trained in Russia to ensure that Russia retained control. So when Rustam Akhmedov asked me this question, I looked at him and I said, no, you know, let me send you a four-star general. He will look familiar to your officers, and that's who should represent our country at the opening of this academy. And Minister Akhmedov, who had two young daughters, declined and said, no, Lisa, I want you to do it, because I want my people to see what women can do in America. So what's true in national security is also true in energy, just as it is in a lot of other fields that do not yet represent the full strength of our countries. I can't overstate the importance of C3E's vital role in celebrating the work of women across energy fields. Over the past few, five years, and as we will do again throughout this symposium, we've recognized and rewarded the variety of ways in which women are advancing clean energy, including through research, advocacy, entrepreneurship, and education. Over the past year and a half, almost two, as Melanie noted, uh, since the president asked me to join the DOE team, I've met with energy leaders from around the world. I've had meaningful interactions with some extraordinary people. And I've relished the opportunity to work with all of my counterparts, but I'll be candid that the vast majority have been men in the public sector and in the private sector, at home and around the world. Yet I have met with global leaders who are notable exceptions, including, for example, Zenaida Monsada, who's now the Philippine Energy Secretary. I met with her when she was officer in charge, when I led the US delegation at the APEC Energy Ministerial in Cebu in the Philippines last year. She rose through the ranks of an organization that she now leads. And interestingly, her team is almost all female. And here with us today, one of our own C3E ambassadors is Fatima Alfura Al Shamsi from the United Arab Emirates. Are you here, Fatima? She's supposed to be joining us. I hope she'll get here soon. Uh, she is an electrical engineer with an MBA whose responsibilities include electricity, clean energy, climate change, and the desalination of water at UAE's Ministry of Energy. I met her during my trip to the UAE last October, where she hosted a wonderful lunch with an impressive group of women at the Mazdar Institute. I was so glad to see her in that environment because it was clear that she's an inspiration to other young women in clean energy from across her region. And here in the United States, we're also making significant strides in getting women into leadership positions. 
at the Department of Energy, women are now responsible for overseeing very important scientific and technological work that supports U.S. national security and U.S. energy security. And women in DOE's 17 national laboratories are performing the kind of cutting edge research that will power the innovation of the future. So things are getting better, but far too often it's still the case that many of us are often the only woman in the room. And that brings me to my next point, which is that we each need to do all that we can do to be ambassadors to young women and girls. We need to do everything we can to show young women that there is a place for them in clean energy fields if they get the requisite education and training, if they work really hard and they persist in breaking through barriers. And I'll emphasize that work really hard point because it's often said about Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire that she danced just as well, but she had to do it backward and in high heels. Sometimes that's what's required to, pr to prove the doubters wrong. While each of the individual act interactions we have every day may not seem like much, as a group we can reach thousands of men and women in countries around the world and demonstrate that women can succeed and thrive and contribute to and indeed lead our efforts to fight climate change and transform our global energy mix. So let me give you an example of how our presence can change the conversation. Last week, I was speaking at an event hosted by the University of Tennessee where we were discussing regional partnerships as part of our work to advance mission innovation. Everyone else on the panel with me was a man, the university president, the congressman from the district, the, and the mayor of Chattanooga. After that event, a young woman came up to me and told me how inspiring it had been to her just to see me there and how much she loved watching DOE's series of videos and interviews on our website with our female STEM leaders. In this series, we've asked women to talk about their work, offer advice for young people looking at STEM careers, and give them a peek at what they do for fun. Finding this online resource, resource made her feel connected to a broader community of women in science, much like what C3E-Net does for women in clean energy. More generally, I've made a point of visiting community colleges, colleges, and universities all across our country to talk about the importance of getting an education in STEM fields. I can tell you that these visits are one of my favorite parts of this job. Indeed, in early 2015, when the president hosted a cybersecurity summit here at Stanford, I met with an impressive group of undergraduate students, including the then student body president of Stanford, all women. And I always encourage students when I talk to them to think about careers in STEM and to think about one of DOE's many internships, fellowships, or jobs. As a passionate believer in the value of public service, in doing something that is larger than yourself, I want to see more women serving in government. But I also encourage young people who don't see themselves going into STEM fields to make sure they nevertheless get a thorough grounding in science and math, engineering and technology, even if they don't think they will use them directly. Because life is not linear, and I will tell you now that if I were going back and started o starting over, I would certainly take more science and math. Science and technology have become so central to every sector of the economy and to our national security that a grounding in the fundamentals will be essential to our leaders of the future, whatever role they play in the private sector, in the public sector, in universities and research. So while I enjoy speaking with women especially about their plans and careers, I also like to speak with all young people, since we'll need all of their talents. Indeed, you don't have to be female to be a role model for women or to have a positive impact on their lives. So let me issue to all of you here in the room and on the live stream a challenge to find talented young people and help them along. Mentors are absolutely crucial. If you look at the beautiful green book that was uh, described earlier, the C3E book that we've published in honor of this fifth year, you will note how many women in the book describe the critical role of a mentor in their development, in changing their lives. 
For example, C3E Ambassador Deborah Rodriguez, who's also receiving the research award here today, described how a professor took a group of undergraduates when she was in college to Brazil and inspired her to become the researcher and educator that she is today. My career would certainly not be what it is today without the investment that mentors made in me. They were mostly men. I didn't have any female role models. But they took an interest in nurturing me and encouraging me to go for a career in a field where there were no women in leadership roles yet. And there was no well-established path. They opened doors for me, and they stayed present and continued to advise me all along the way. Indeed, one of them is still here at Stanford today, Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, who's in his late 80s. I worked very hard to earn their respect and be deserving of the time and effort that they invested in me. This reflects the fact that men will continue to play a key role, and it's why some of our C3E ambassadors, such as Bob Marley, sitting at the table over there, director of our International Science and Technology Program, are men. And of course, Arun was recognized as well, co-director of Precourt and energy innovator. I have to say that though Stanford has laid, laid claim to him now, we consider him to be one of our own at DOE as well. All over the world, men are supporting women in their work, promoting them to leadership positions, and encouraging them to show the world what they can do. They're raising daughters for whom they have big dreams, and they're building life partnerships with women. So they have a stake in this outcome as well. And in an act that seems quite simple, but really is quite important for ensuring that well-qualified women are given a voice and are heard by their peers, we're seeing more men publicly refuse to participate on MANLs, the new nickname for all male panels <laughs> at conferences. Earlier this month, I learned that five highly sought after Australian speakers in leadership and performance announced that they would no longer be on or moderate all male panels. And last month, Sri Srinivasan, the chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, announced that he won't speak to or attend all male panels. So that leads me to my final thought before I wrap up and we get into our discussion with past award winners. In April, I moderated a panel at the Department of Energy's remarkable Big Ideas Summit. And I had the chance to uh, be Oprah with three outstanding technology innovators. They also happen to be three outstanding women with extraordinary track records of achievement in their respective fields. Pam Melroy is the Deputy Director of the Tactical Technology Office at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Dr. Deva Newman is the Deputy Administrator of NASA. And Dr. Jill Ruby is the head of DOE's own national, Sandia National Laboratory, where she leads our efforts to maintain the US nuclear stockpile and perform some of DOE's most innovative research. And she is the first woman to lead one of the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons labs. In the course of this panel, Jill said something that I thought was really striking. In response to a question I asked each of the participants about whether they thought that women's leadership styles are different, she said she thought that women lead differently by being more inclusive as they lead. And I think that's a very important observation. We don't want more women in leadership positions or in clean energy fields so that we can create an exclusive women's club. That wouldn't make our discoveries or our decisions better necessarily. If we're going to meet these global climate and clean energy goals that we have set, if we're going to transform our global energy mix, we need to welcome everyone to the table and bring all of our strengths to bear. We'll need to work together as a collaborative team. We'll need to recruit, train, promote, and encourage talented young people. The young men and women whom we guide and mentor today are the ones who will carry our work forward and discover the solutions that we need to save our planet. Each person in this room can contribute to this future, whether it's through the scientific research that you do, the policies you design and implement, the technologies that you work to deploy, or the young person to whom you give the confidence that he or she can take on hard challenges and conquer them. Thank you for being a part of this extraordinary journey with us. 
And if you want to continue our conversation beyond today, please follow me on Twitter at LSR Tweets, where I try to lift up gifted people like you and share your achievements with a wider audience. Thank you. <laughs>